Good evening. Welcome to the Kent City Council meeting for Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020. If you would all stand and join me in the flag salute, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, Kim, could you call the roll, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mayor Ralph? Here. Council President Troutner? Here. Council Member Boyce? Here. Council Member Fincher? Here. Council Member Core? Here. Council Member Larmer? Here. Council Member Michaud? Here. Council Member Thomas? Here. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you, Kim. Uh, moving on to agenda approval. Are there changes to the agenda from council or staff? Derek? Thank you, Mayor. No changes to the agenda, but just want to let the council and audience know that item 9A is an alternative to item 6A. So if the council takes action under 6A, then no action is necessary later on the agenda. Perfect. With that change noted, um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. I have a motion and seconds. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Perfect. Motion carries 7 0. Thank, Thank you. All right. We will move on to public communications. Council President Troutner, do you have some public recognition? I do. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have a civic student in the audience this evening. Um, we have Kamal Bular. Is that correct? All right. And you are a student at Kentwood. If you'd like to, you can come up to the podium and introduce yourself and let us know why you're here. Uh, hi there, guys. I'm Kamal from Kentwood High School. I came here for my civics project, and I want to learn about how city works. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and this is the senior, your senior year, right? Yes. Nice. Way to go. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you very, very much. Council members, any other public recognition before we move on to Employee of the Month? All right, seeing none. Um, it is my honor to announce the March 2020 Employee of the Month. So every month our employees to get together and they nominate one of their peers that they feel like has been doing outstanding work, whether <coughs> on just a daily basis or in a specific project. Um, so it means a lot. It's coming from the folks that they work with on a regular basis. I am pleased to announce that our March Employee of the Month is Eric Connor. Eric was hired August 18th, 2014 as the construction engineering manager in the construction division of Public Works. He is responsible for supervising and performing complex and professional engineering duties in the construction administration. He provides coordination and direction of Public Works civil engineering projects, training, supervising, and assignment reviews of his team's work. He assures efficient and effective function of the construction section. Congratulations, Eric. Thank you, Chad, Mayor. Would you like to say a few words? Yes, I would. Uh, Chad Beeren, Deputy Public Works Director. I'm pleased to be here tonight. Uh, generally, I'm usually in the back watching a supervisor introduce uh, somebody they oversee, and I oversee Eric, so I'm up here tonight. Um, just very briefly, uh, I think you uh, said it encapsulated what it is Eric does, but he also oversees a team of 11 folks that uh, take care of our capital projects within the city. When Eric got here five years ago, we were doing about 20 to $25 million a year in work. We're up to about 40 to $50 million a year over the last couple of years, and that's a lot of work for a team of, of essentially five people to oversee, along with the team that oversees uh, private development. So just a brief uh, set of pictures. There's Eric on the left and a scarecrow on the right. <laughs> uh, team of capital improvement uh, projects uh, managers. These guys oversee the majority of the projects, along with some help from these three folks that uh, really uh, the, the city drives past through and around as we put, uh, construct them. Uh, projects such as the Upper Mill Creek Dam on 104th that's going to be used to improve uh, the flooding that happens in the valley from Mill Creek. Uh, the 218th Street project that just opened up uh, this fall. The 220th grade separation that's going to open up this year at, at uh, Union Pacific Railroad. 
And then we're replacing the fuel tank islands that uh, police officers use along with all of our, all of our operations crews over at our ops uh, facility near the Green River. And we're going to be improving water pressure up on the uh, East Hill at the 640 booster pump station very uh, shortly. And then on our private development side, these guys oversee not only over 600 uh, utility permits every year, work that gets done in the right of way that the uh, Comcast, CenturyLink, PSE, the work that they do to keep everybody uh, with power, gas, uh, telephone, internet, but also uh, private development projects such as uh, our uh, Goodman Real Estate Project at 64th and Meeker. They see all the civil improvements out in the street as well as a lot of the other underground improvements. Uh, Marquee on Meeker are now called Ethos on, uh, out at the edge of Meeker Street. The Ridge Town Homes, which is right next to 218th. And then, of course, our Blue Origin uh, uh, facility that was opened up last year, as well as uh, smaller plats and subdivisions that folks will see uh, throughout their neighborhoods. So they get involved in every aspect of the work, and Eric oversees that. So very happy to have him on board. Uh, as uh, Mayor mentioned, he's been with us five years. Prior to that, he had 15 years in heavy construction, so he's a fellow who really knows what he's doing, and we're glad to have him with us. What are you going to say? Um, I just want to thank Chad and all the other employees that we work with. I really didn't expect any appreciation or anything like that. Um, what I do is a reflection of the guys that I work with. I've got a great team that surrounds me, and they take good care of me. And any of the excess success with the construction that you see is really because of those guys. I really appreciate what they do for us. So. Thank you for this. I really appreciate it. Oh, very grateful. Let's do a picture. The painful part. Yeah. <laughs> and I had a few long lists. <laughs> One more quick plug. I just want to say uh, thanks to uh, Eric's wife, Irene, and his daughter, Clara, who made it tonight. Uh, they share him with us every day. And uh, he puts in a lot, of, uh, a lot of hours and a lot of uh, tough work making sure these things get done. So thanks for coming. Right. The next item on our agenda is an appointment, a recommendation um, for the council to confirm an appointment to the Parks and Recs Commission. Um, this evening, we are bringing forward Sung Yoon. Uh, Mr. Yoon, are you here tonight? All right. Would you like to come up? I'm going to give you a little introduction, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Mr. Yoon is a Kent resident and is in sports production at ESPN. He enjoys the diversity of Kent and the offerings of cultural events that we offer for our residents. Um, and he does, you know, he's been spending some time in our parks and trails and knows that there's, we have work to do. So I appreciate that um, recognition, but then also the willingness to step up and help us figure out the best way to do that. So I am um, asking council under consent agenda to confirm that appointment. And um, Mr. Yoon, would you like to say a few words? Yes, I would, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, to the uh, for the warm introduction, and to the esteemed members of the City Council. Uh, it's an honor to, to be here. Um, why did I choose the PRC? Uh, first off, I've been a proud resident of Kent for 27 years, and um, and in that time, I have witnessed some good things and some bad things within our city. Um, the, dur I mean, during the city's population growth, uh, I. I started to notice the deterioration of our city, and with with that, I have seen uh, our streets littered with trash or graffiti, and uh, uh, not to mention the uh, the apathy towards maintenance of our parks and trails that are instead used for criminal activity or loitering. Uh, just. I just want us to uh, reestablish Kent as a place where families can feel safe to take their children to the park and, and walk the trails without fear. And uh, I just want to uh, make, help make Kent a desirable city for, uh, for families to raise their children and not to have a negative stigma for our, our communities. Lastly, uh, I just want fam uh, families should be able to enjoy the resources and the after-school programs that our community center provides 
because I believe that an active family is a happy family. I uh, just wanted to thank uh, Madam Mayor, the PRC Director uh, Julie, and Co-Chair and Chair Richard and Amy for my appointment, and uh, just I, I look forward to serving with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Before you sit down, let's get a quick picture. Oh. Of the night. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Our, our commissions and boards are a really important way for our residents to get involved in things that they're passionate about in the city. So I really do appreciate everyone that steps up, volunteers their time, and helps provide guidance to this council and to my office on um, ways that we can help move this city forward in a positive way. And in the case of some up here, it is also a direct path to the city council. So you never know what's in your future. <laughs> All right, we are going to move on um, to community events. Council President Troutner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We do have some events coming up at SSO Shower Center. The Seattle Thunderbirds play the Everett Silver Tips on Sunday, March 8th. The Tacoma Stars will play the San Diego Soccer in a game on Friday, March 13th. The Seattle Thunderbirds also play Vancouver Giants Saturday, March 14th. Then we have Camilla Mexican Rock Band, which will perform on Friday, March 20th, and tickets are still available for that. Tax Time Turn Up, which is an R&B concert headlining Escape 3 and other performers, including Tamar Braxton, Carl Thomas, Avant, and KK Wyatt on Saturday, March 4th. Tickets are on sale for that. And the first annual Kent Chamber of Commerce, Leading Women, Leading the the Way Summit is April 17th, and registration is open for that. And I believe Madam Mayor will be in, involved speaking in that. At that. Yes, yes, thank you. And then Lauren Daigle, which is a Christian artist, will be performing on April 21st, 25th, and they added a second performance on April 26th. So we've got quite a few performers and artists that come to show wear, and they add other events or second events. So it's great to see that... Um, Things are going well there, so thank you. Yes, thank you. Councilmember Fincher. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On March 13th, we have uh, the first of the last two performances for the Spotlight Series. We have the performance on the 13th of the We Shall Overcome. It's an MLK tribute gospel choir that will be singing and doing all sorts of uh, songs and all from the civil rights uh, era, from the civil rights fight. And then on the, the other performance is on the 19th, and that's Catapult. That is a dance performance. And then we have on the 14th, which is a Saturday, Kent Kids Arts Day. $10 for kids who are preschool through fourth grade. Adults and kids under two are free. And it's just, uh, it's over at Kent Commons. It's a day of fun crafts. There's sewing, there's Japanese print making, there is, making wax handprints and just all sorts of things, robots out of recycled materials, all sorts of different crafts and all for kids. So it's a fun day and all of that for just $10. That is it. All right, thank you. Um, I do also would like to remind everyone that on Thursday, the 5th of March, is the State of the City Address. We are holding that event this year at the new Blue, Blue Origin building down off of 212th and 76th. Doors open at 6 o'clock. Um, it's a free event. Would love to see you all come out. And as a reminder, just some of the facility rules, um, there will be police officers working to direct traffic and parking, and no large bags are allowed in the facility. So um, not, no backpacks or large purses. So would hope to see you all out on Thursday. And for those of you that can't attend in person, um, we will be live, uh, Facebook Live um, with the event, as well as it'll be available on our website after the event. So hope to see you at, at the State of the City Address on Thursday. Okay, we are going to move on to reports from council and staff. This is the opportunity that you have to hear about all the work that your council members are doing 
um, outside of these council meetings, representing you on regional committees, making sure that Kent's voice and our opinions are heard and part of the regional decision-making policy. I am going to start this evening and um, separate from my normal report, just wanna talk a little bit about what is on everybody's mind, on every news channel, on every Facebook feed and, and Twitter feed, and that's the coronavirus. Um, I want to assure everyone in the city of Kent that the health and well-being of our residents is absolutely paramount to us. We, um, we, meaning our emergency management team, my office, working closely with the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, the Washington State Department of Health, and King County Public Health to address this issue. It is their realm, so we are taking our guidance and information from their directives. What, um, what those organizations are publishing and the information that they're pushing out is the same information that we're sharing. We're just working to make sure everybody has that information available. We're being briefed daily by public health officials and actively monitoring the situation. Like I said, we're following their recommendations and guidance. I wanna let everyone know that at this time there has not been any recommendation for social distancing, meaning that you shouldn't be in public. So those rules apply to, to people that are immune compromised. Same things that apply when you have the flu or the cold. Um, I wanna let everyone know that communication from the city will, will run through my office and emergency management. It'll be available on um, our Facebook page and Twitter feed so you can go there and, and really what we're providing are links to the organizations that are putting out those official notices. Just wanna remind people that the best way to keep yourself safe, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Um, if you cough or sneeze, use your elbow or a tissue. Um, same things that we talk about when we're you know, talking to our kids about, about that personal hygiene. Um, st avoid contact with sick people, and if you are sick, stay home and um, help protect others that way. The, the preparedness piece, we're seeing all of the runs on Costco and all those things running out. Really, it's just making sure that you have supplies at home should you need to, to stay there. Um, we're seeing a lot of fear and anxiety over this, and I really just want to assure you that we're taking guidance from, from the health professionals, and we're not seeing a need for a lot of the panic that's there. Just be safe, be smart, and um, use some, some common sense, essentially. That's really the message that we want to put out there. If things were to change, um, our social media feeds are really the best place to get that information along with, with general media. Um, and just, just know that we are keeping ourselves informed and doing everything we can to help keep our residents safe. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Derek Matheson for his report. All right, my very brief report. Uh, my written information is in the packet. We do have a short executive session this evening um, to discuss property negotiations. Um, the expected time is five minutes and there will be action when we reconvene in open session. Okay. Thank you. Council President Troutner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We had a couple presentations during workshop today. The first one was on the city's transportation master plan, and we've been talking about this for quite some time, and we'll continue to see this in workshop. But um, as we look at this plan, we talked about the funding uh, for transportation today and some of those challenges, which is streamlined sales tax, economy, um, availability of grants and future trends as we see what's happening with our own city in Kent. Um, we do have some challenges, like I mentioned. We have the streamlined sales tax money that um, is not as much as it used to be. We also have construction costs that continue to go up as projects continue to get um, put aside. So other funding and revenue sources we have are the, the general fund, we also have the state motor vehicle fuel tax, which most cities only get about 4% of that. We have local improvement districts. We have transportation impact fees. And we also have grants, which are one of the things that our city relies on. We have federal grants. We have state grants. We have county grants. And these are all things that our uh, public works team uh, works very hard to um, get funding for different projects in our city that help alleviate that burden on our residents. So lots more to come on that. Basically, it's figuring out how we balance that and how we implement um, 
the needs that our city has based on the funding that we have available. So we're gonna be talking about that in the next couple weeks and I believe um, they'll be coming back to workshop on May 19th. So the other thing that we talked about was the targeted residential investment program and basically that is the multifamily tax exemption um, that we will be hearing more about as well. Um, we have a plan for establishing our downtown and Midway and um, residential areas targeted consistent with our adopted policy. So we had a great presentation by Haley Bonsteel and hopefully we gave her some direction. She's going to answer some of the questions we had and come back to us and we'll continue to have that discussion about what we want to see for that plan and developing those areas um, in the future. I also attended, last Thursday, Chief Padilla and I attended the Regional Safety, Law, Safety and Justice um, in Seattle, and we talked about school safety and heard from different cities on how their resource officers work in their school. And as we go to these regional committees, I'm often reminded how well we do things here in Kent and how well our officers are out in our community, but also working in our schools to keep our students safe. The Regional Transit Committee met on the 19th of February, and that committee will continue to get together. We will have workshops throughout the summer to talk about um, the service guidelines for Metro. Our job is to give input and um, how we wanna see those changes happen through our communities and how we wanna see those guidelines implemented. So there's gonna be a lot of discussion on that, and um, I will come back to council and let everyone know how that's going. So. Um, everyone is very busy. We're going to start down with Council Member Michaud and hear what she's been up to. Thank you, Council President. I have something to say today. <laughs> so I serve on the Kent's Human Services Commission, and right now they're entering the grant application process for organizations that provide human services to our community. And um, the Human Services Commission goes through this grant process every two years, awarding a little bit more than a million dollars um, a year to various organizations. And for this round, the goal of the commission is to ensure equity and attempt to eliminate bias in the grant review review process. So the commission is going through some interactive equitable grant making trainings and we had our first one last week. And also for any service providers out there, I just want to let you know that the grant application opened today and that'll be open for a little longer than a month. And if you need any assistance applying, you can always contact city staff. Thank you. Council Member Core. Thank you. Um, I serve on King County Growth Management Planning Council. Uh, we met on February 26th and uh, uh, we uh, talked about countywide planning policies. We started working, we will start working on those in June and will be adopted by um, Growth Management Planning Council in December. Uh, it'll be setting uh, urban growth area boundaries, criteria for revising growth boundaries. Uh, we also, uh, we also appointed members to King County Affordable Housing Committee. I know Councilmember Larmer serves on that. And we also had a report from King County Affordable Housing Committee. They're working on recommended updates to housing chapter for the King County um, countywide planning policies. And the goal, uh, with the goal of supporting, supporting meeting the region's need for affordable housing. And I also serve on Puget Sound Clean Air Agency Advisory Council. Uh, we met on February 27th, and we had presentation from the staff on draft clean fuel standard. Um, it was open for public comment uh, October through um, February, and they had over 6,000 comments, um, over 5,000 unique comments from the community, and it was usually a very positive feedback from the community about improving air quality, um, and clean fuel standards actually protecting the people. And uh, we're still working on that and continue working um, strategic plan for 2021. So I'll have that update for you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Larmer. Thank you, Council President. I, um, as Council Member Corr mentioned, I serve on the King County Affordable Housing Committee and we have not met since my last report. We'll be meeting again at the end of this month, uh, March 30th. Um, and I also serve on the King County Aging and Disabilities Advisory Council, and we will be having our uh, March meeting next Friday. So I will have reports um, at our next council meeting. Great, thank you, Council Member Boyce. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have not met since our last meeting, but I sit on the Sound City Association um, 
pick committee, which is a public issue committee, um, really it's 38 city get together, and we try to really work together as a team and look at it from a regional perspective. So, but uh, my next uh, meeting is a week from tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Thomas. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I serve on the Regional Fire Authority for Puget Sound here, along with Council President Troutner and Council Member Boyce. Now, I wasn't able to attend the meeting last time, so I'm hoping they might add to this, but uh, just to remind people that we do meet tomorrow night at 5.30 as far as the RFA. However, those members that I just mentioned are supposed to be there at 5 for pictures. So I want to thank you for that. It's going to be at Station 78. That's the one at Covington at the end of 256, basically. That's all I have, Madam President. Great, thank you. Council Member Fincher. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, the, both KCD and MID, KCD being King Conservation District, and MID, Mental Illness and Drug Dependency Advisory uh, Committee, which I serve on, both of those meetings were canceled for this month, well, for the month of February. The Board of Supervisors for King Conservation District is looking at changing the format and timing of our meetings, going from a monthly meeting to possibly a quarterly meeting. So we're waiting for news on that. So uh, that will be taking place over the next few months. So we do not anticipate a meeting until at least June. For mid, we will be back at a meeting on the 28th of this month, always the fourth Thursday, downtown Seattle. On March 11th, for the Arts Commission here in Kent, there the, uh, at 5 p.m. will be the closing. There is an open call for artists. So if you are an artist anywhere in Washington State, especially if you are in Kent and if you haven't applied before, you are encouraged to submit your art, it's for the uh, juried art contest that we do here during the summertime. Also, you might have heard me mention that Centennial is like a walking, or like a, an art museum with all of the art over in there. That is what, uh, where those purchases come from, from the artists who are selected from this application process. So you can find information on that in the art section of our kentwa.gov website. And again, that closes. All your submissions must be in by March 11th, 5 p.m. That is it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That ends our reports. All right. Thank you very much. We will move on um, in our agenda to the public hearing. Tonight, we will be holding a public hearing on Rally Val on the Rally the Valley sub-area plan, the ordinance amending the comprehensive plan and development regulations. I'm just going to give a rundown of how this will work. So staff will give a presentation, and then I will invite the public up to provide testimony, written statements, or other evidence. Public input must relate to the subject of the public hearing, so Rally the Valley. Council members will have an opportunity to ask questions during the hearing as well. If you're here to testify on this matter or present written statements or evidence, I do ask that you come up to the clerk's desk and sign in up here at that front table. Um, with that, we will go ahead and open the public hearing for Rally the Valley sub-area plan, ordinance amending the comprehensive plan and development regulations. And I will ask um, Bill to go ahead and make the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members. Um, I'm Bill Ellis, the Chief Economic Development Officer, and I'm, I'm here just to say a few words of introduction uh, to the Council in, in advance of the fuller presentation from uh, Haley Bonsteel, our Long Range Planning Manager. I've spoken on several occasions to this Council about some of the long range trends that we're seeing that impact our industrial valley, uh, and we've seen some of those accelerate. Uh, we've watched as e commerce has uh, grown and put a lot of uh, uh, development market interest into our industrial uh, area. We've also watched as that same market interest has resulted in more capital intensive warehouses uh, with greater automation and multi-story warehouses. We've seen a revivified uh, space race internationally uh, that, uh, as Mayor Ralph, can you can see at the state of the speech, uh, state of the city speech on Thursday uh, at the new Blue Origin headquarters uh, has local impacts as well, where we've we've seen advanced the advanced manufacturing sector grow in the Kent Valley over the last 10 years uh, and uh, have a lot of promise and new opportunity. 
Uh, we've also seen the incentive for cities uh, uh, to uh, welcome wholesaling into their communities has been a little bit challenged from a, a revenue standpoint as a state streamlined sales tax declined from a peak in the city from 43% to 22% as that uh, state sales tax change changed. However, uh, I think throughout the Rally the Valley process, what we've kept first and foremost is that we have a vision for an industrial business district that is primarily industrial and that that ecosystem is made healthy and strong by having a diversified portfolio of suppliers, services, amenities, uh, all different aspects of the supply chain and that the sum of the parts are greater than, than the whole. Uh, so we would like to have a great industrial district and we want to have a great industrial code this is the one we have today it goes dates back to 1973 <laughs> updated for the 21st century and so uh, we really worked hard to have an advisory panel that had a diverse set of viewpoints from real estate from business uh, we've tried to survey employees at the from the public uh, we tried to get a diversity of opinions um, and what we've come up with is to look and look anew at what is one of our scarcest increasingly scarce resources which is our land base with our land use play in to think about how can we have more intensive use and how do we have space for all the different kinds of businesses that we'd like to be here while creating flexibility and balance to accommodate them. We've looked at ways to create more flexibility within the walls of a warehouse. So collapsing our use tables to allow a wide variety of different types of uses and letting the market decide what happens within those walls. At the same time, we're also encouraging flexible site designs that either think outside of the box of what a normal industrial development proposal might be, or also uh, create more flexibility uh, for a developer to, uh, who is looking to have new focus on amenities or new focus for design on the people who would occupy those spaces. Uh, we've looked and sought for balance uh, in the Industrial Valley where we have a variety of proposed districts uh, that look at many different types of industrial building types and then think what is best suited in what district. Uh, it's a very large valley, and uh, so even as we've had more new openness to different kinds of use, staff has also had an openness to facts. Uh, one of the facts that would kind of challenge some of our pre preconceptions at the beginning when we talked to some of our neighbors uh, was around manufacturing industrial centers as a land use uh, designation from the region, which we thought was very restrictive, and talking to Auburn and other cities who hadn't adopted manufacturing industrial centers, they thought that was too restrictive. We've actually, in this set of standards and designs we're actually proposing to, in, in the plan, to double the area of our manufacturing industrial center, even as we've tried to create new flexibility within that framework. Because we did recognize that there were things about the land use policy that were leading to growth and jobs in manufacturing, but we also realized that we needed to have balance and revenue and flexibility uh, to have other types of businesses coincide in those areas. Um, on the market trends, we've seen growth in manufacturing, as I mentioned, uh, stabilizing office vacancy, although it's not there at the point where you would see new growth of new buildings, uh, higher retail rents in the valley as compared to the citywide, and healthy year-over-year -year in the flex tech market for rent growth. However, zoning by itself, design standards by themselves, is not going to create the demand that drives jobs or economic growth. The plan references a range of activities across multiple departments here at the city. And all of these actions are meant to better set the table for those types of businesses that want to come here, that want to stay, or want to grow, and would add to the variety, diversifying our industrial portfolio, add to the vibrancy of our business district, and therefore to the resiliency of the city's economy and to the city's uh, sustainable fiscal fortunes. Uh, we are, yes, a hub of logistics, we are a center of advanced manufacturing, and bar none, we're the best place to build a space, outer space vehicle, and have been for decades. Uh, we're very proud of that. So while the work remains, even after tonight's vote on the land use and design standards piece, the work remains across departments and for years to come in a variety of areas to make sure that economic growth continues to be strong in Kent and that there's job growth. What you see tonight uh, is a key part of accomplishing those objectives. So I just wanted to emphasize once again, uh, even the best laid plans depend on the actions of many others, but with the action tonight, we do do something in the direction of uh, the vision that we are uh, been discussing for some time. With that, I'll turn it over. Thank you.
Hello again. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. Um, it's a big plan before you tonight to make a vote on, and adopting a subarea plan is always a big endeavor. It's a very thick packet. It includes a lot of pieces, and we've talked a lot about it. So my plan for tonight is to go over the key details that are sort of emblematic of the plan as a whole, and uh, that are sort of the most salient um, things that we want to leave with, um, while also recognizing that we have on record a lot of the details in previous meetings. So we can obviously go in more detail, but I'm, I'm going to only drill down sort of strategically. So to start with, why do we do this plan? Uh, it's mandated for regional growth centers that are designated through PSRC. So a big part of this work has been looking at that regional industrial land use policy guidance and saying, this is not enough. Just maintaining industrial acreage does not necessarily help the local economy. It does not necessarily preserve living wage jobs, does not necessarily support a manufacturing industry that is the keystone of the regional economy. And so what we've done as part of this project is to redefine manufacturing and industrial centers to actually, rather than focusing on the quantity of land, to focus on the quality of life for people who work within them. So we did, as Bill mentioned, we are proposing to expand our MIC boundaries and our interpretation of MIC requirements to go beyond sort of rote compliance and instead to um, be strategic and smart in our application of those regulations, which has actually started a regional dialogue. So PSRC is set to convene a working group on the topic this year, take, taking a, another look at their industrial land use policy um, as a result of our efforts. So um, we've been really trying to focus on the human impact of the policies rather than just the letter of the law. Um, and that human impact, of course, is on the industrial workers who were our constituents throughout this project. Um, so we took the project to them as much as possible to figure out how we could better serve them. And uh, looks like I'm a little out of order there. Uh, we'll jump back to those previous slides in one second. Uh, the need for better transportation connections more lunch and commercial and service options, and more parks and trails connections and amenity spaces was very clear from talking to over 300 workers, from talking to dozens of business owners and stakeholders. Um, we had six advisory panel meetings, seven staff working group meetings, nine employer interviews. We talked to a lot of people, and we really heard these things over and over. It was. Um, it was very evident that this was a, you know, there were major opportunities for the city to improve the experience of the valley. And so this plan identifies those gaps, those opportunities for improvement, and fills them through land use changes, development regulations, and capital project identification. So now we're getting back to those land use maps. Sorry about that. The land use changes include new designations that are focused around key corridors and prominent gateways and as well as taking into consideration access to transit and adjacency to residential and other uses. So on the left is the proposed land use designations and on the right is the proposed zoning. We've overhauled our zoning code and that is why your packet is so very thick tonight because we really went through everything that we could to uh, have our codes reflect modern industry trends and best practices. And we came up with innovative requirements that scale the amount of investment that's required in a site to um, how the proposed use contributes to or detracts from our vision for a thriving industrial ecosystem. So we've adopted on some level of basic requirements related to like multimodal connections, um, just to ensure that the way I say it is we don't want somebody who takes the bus to feel like a second class citizen. You should be able to get from your bus stop into your workplace with a direct route, things like that. Um, but we've also provided options for increasing your contribution, whether it's to a nearby park or trail, or by building more on site in exchange for development considerations that are important to the development community. So our approach here was to incentivize without penalizing and to strategically reduce barriers to development while simultaneously raising the bar for design and quality in those highest profile areas. So I want to talk through just briefly an example, um, drill down a little bit on design. So we have many images we could look at, but we chose one that's relatively simple just to show um, kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about our new design requirements. So this image is from the archives of the Tilt Up Concrete Association, and I now know a lot more about Tilt Up as a building system than I ever thought I would. Um, Tilt Up is the most typical building system that's utilized in valley development, um, but our regulations could easily be met through any method of construction. So what you see here, and I guess I can try to use this, these are, uh, this, this 
portion of the building here would be considered modulation, as with these sort of three, what we would call fins, or I guess there's four. This is all oriented around an entry that um, architects might say is significantly fenestrated. That just means there's a lot of windows. And I'm uh, um, imagining that the road is out here, and so what this is doing is making more visible to the public this sort of dynamic business activity. Imagine if this were a blank wall and you were driving by versus what you see here. It's quite a big difference. So um, another thing that you know is amazingly, um, you would just wouldn't think how important it is, is this fenestration around secondary entries. So picture a blank wall with a door with no windows, and then you know compare that to what you see here. It's these little human touches that really can make a big difference. Canopies are also shown here in materials changes, and these all provide interest and show a level of investment and quality without making anything infeasible. So I want to say again that we have written our regulations in such a way that there are many, many options for how to meet the requirements. These are just a few examples. Um, and we'll be adding a lot of images into a handbook for planners to be able to have ideas to help architects through this process. Um, excuse me. But hopefully this gives you a sense for what some of the architectural terms mean. And in my um, dealings with the Tilt Up Concrete Association and reviewing all of their uh, materials, I'm, I'm very confident that our regulations will not make construction infeasible, no matter what's getting built. So there are a lot of details to the regulations that I'm not going into here. Um, we discussed them at the February 18th workshop. However, I'm cognizant of the fact that that was not on video. So I do want to say for the, for the record, and if anybody's watching this video years in the future, wondering about the details, that the February 10th Land Use and Planning Board meeting included a 90-minute presentation on just about every detail in this plan. So that video is available on the city website for as long as the city website exists. So the plan as a whole essentially looks at all of the ways that the city can improve the industrial valley from marketing and messaging to strategic partnerships to capitalizing on existing assets through investment, optimizing financing mechanisms, and basically doing everything we can to elevate people's experience of being in the valley. Um, as you're probably aware, the project has not been without controversy. Uh, some folks would like to keep building what has been built for decades without any consideration for what has changed. But obviously, as Bill mentioned, with the change of streamlined sales tax, and then of course with property tax being capped at 1%, the city is just not in a position to allow business to continue as usual, where essentially development can run roughshod over the valley without any thoughtful regulation looking, for, uh, looking out for the little guys. And the little guys in this case could be manufacturing businesses who can't find space to rent, or it could be somebody who has to walk in a ditch to get to their workplace because because that's the only option um, getting off the bus. But that said, we have not ignored any comment that we've received. We've carefully considered every single thing that's come our way. And we've strived to find compromise at every turn of the project. So I want to talk you through some of the places where we've compromised and some of the places where we haven't, to be clear on, on that. So in the last few weeks, we've introduced several options for increased flexibility in our design regulations. Specifically, uh, we introduced a, a numeric uh, departure of 25%. So any nu uh, numeric standard within a few different strategic sections of the design, gu design guidelines, not every single section, but a couple of them, uh, with the at the director's discretion, you can get up to 25% of that number reduced. And it's all about those intent statements, which I believe I spoke to you all about last time, which is where we're trying to be really clear about the design intent give flexibility for how to meet it. Uh, we've also clarified several points that were unclear to stakeholders, such as the you know, very important dock high door ratio that we've talked about. That doesn't include grade level doors, and that's really important because manufacturing businesses do need those grade level doors. We don't want to preclude those. We don't think that they are equivalent to trucking activity the way that the dock high doors are this proxy for trucking activity. Um, we also revised several requirements related to uh, truck courts and pedestrian connections just to make sure we weren't accidentally mandating a, a modal conflict where you have peds walking through heavy truck areas. And um, we also adjusted several of our sort of enhanced options that can uh, buy more doors. Uh, we adjusted them to better balance the cost and benefits of increased dock high doors with sort of what you're getting for that. So these are taking in comments that we heard and being very responsive to those. We've given really careful consideration, um, but we also received comments last week that after careful consideration we thought would undermine the project. So I want to talk to you about those briefly. Uh, we had requests to significantly reduce the amount of amenity space that was required, and we felt that what we were requiring is really reasonable, and we didn't see a reason to, to make that smaller. 
Um, we also had a request to replace building modulation with already required landscaping, so essentially having a blank wall with a tree in front of it instead of actually doing something to the building. And that's the kind of suggestion that to us feels like it would undermine the project. So um, we held the line, and we've taken the perspective of the business community into account without sacrificing that vision of a healthy and desirable place to work. So. Um, that was really important to me, and I want to say that, for the record, I, I feel really good about where we've um, ended up. We have compromised significantly over the course of the project. It went in different directions than we expected. Um, I feel that, at the end, we are going to get a much better result than we would have without the project, and we will not be uh, you know, precluding development, and that, that is a consideration that we needed to take into account. So, I want to thank the council and mayor for putting the interim zoning in a year ago because it really allowed us to explore all of the options that we needed to um, without precluding any opportunities that um, you know development patterns that we'd been seeing for years if they had continued um, you know would have would have just made it so that some of this wouldn't have mattered. Um, and we also want to thank you for taking the time to discuss this project so very much. I know it's uh, you have a lot on your plates, and this was a big project, and we we took a bit of time with it. I, I think that was important, and. Um, I think that you know this city made choices to make the valley into what it is today. We had decades of investment in levees to keep the valley from flooding. We had dec decades of investment in the transportation system. Uh, and now freight can move faster than any of us can really wrap our minds around. <laughs> so um, you know those were city choices that made the valley. And that means that we can make different choices today that make the valley into what it will be in the future. So understanding that this is a 20-year plan, uh, and so it's not exactly tomorrow, um, I, I do want to uh, ask council tonight to make a choice that steers the valley into being what it can be uh, tomorrow. And um, I think to me that's somewhere that any of us would be uh, honored to be employed. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Haley. Um, questions from council? Hey, you've covered it all. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. Um, so if there are no questions from council, I would like to now invite the public to provide testimony, written statements, or other evidence. Um, if you could please keep your comments to three minutes and state your name um, and city of residence for the record. Kim, could you call our speakers, please? I have one person signed up to speak on the public hearing, and that's Mike Pruitt from Sigali Properties. Good evening, and, and thank you for uh, having me here tonight, um, Mayor Ralph, um, council members. Um, I'm Mike Pruitt with Sigali Properties. I uh, was here a couple weeks ago, and I've been intricately involved in this process since it started as a member of the Planning Advisory Committee. With me tonight in the audience is Mark Sigali and his daughter Kirsten also, who have been in, involved in this process. Um, I think as many of you know, the Sigali family has owned and developed property in the Greater Kent Valley for over 90 years. So they've been here since it was agricultural and they've watched it change into what it is today. Um, a lot of the comments that Haley was mentioning, they were generated by us. We, we build industrial buildings and we like to think that we build incredibly nice, functional industrial buildings and we know how to do it well. Um, and so we are happy that the city engaged with us over the last couple of weeks to add some flexibility, which was key in making the proposed design guidelines in this plan uh, a better outcome for everybody. Um, as the city prepares to adopt uh, these new guidelines, uh, two key things were important to remember that came out of the Rally the, the Valley effort. One, um, Industrial area and warehousing and logistics in general, a huge employer in the region, will continue to be a huge employer and it will always be important. We understand the desire for aerospace and aeronautic related jobs and manufacturing, but there's always going to be a logistics component here that's going to be very important. The other thing, uh, dimensions the Echo Northwest study demonstrated that warehousing and logistics is a key contributor to the overall city budget, will continue to be, um, and they pay its way for the impacts that they generate. Uh, the Sigali family would specifically like to thank Council Member Boyce for stepping up and getting these meetings together, for Bill and for Kurt and for Haley and for uh, having the meetings and having the back and forth that it took to get this this far. So um, we're here to speak in support for the package that you have in front of you tonight. 
we think you know implementing it adopting it gives us the flexibility we need to continue to try and develop um, you know a number one you know industrial projects here in the region and and still be competitive while while doing it so that any questions Mike, I want to start and just say thank you very much. Um, your engagement in this process has made it a better product. Um, the willingness to have the conversations back and forth. I know that there's been, you know, it's been a lot, right? This was a, a, a new process for all of us. We all kind of had some ideas of where we were headed, but through your input as a member of that advisory committee and then your willingness over the last few weeks to help make the refinements, um, I am grateful for because I really do believe it makes a better product. So I just want to say thank you. All right. yeah. Thank you. Council members, any questions for Mr. Pruitt? Thank you very much. Um, Kim, is that our only speaker? That was the only speaker. All right. Um, if we've got no speakers and no documents to admit into the record, anything that anyone's received? Okay. With that, a motion would be in order to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carries 7-0. The public hearing is now closed. Um, Council, now is your opportunity for comments or discussion and debate on this issue. Any any comments, questions before we move into a motion? Okay. Um, all right. Since there are no questions, if um, someone has a motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the Council adopt Ordinance Number 4355, amending the City's Comprehensive Plan to include the Rally of the Valley Industrial Subarea Plan and Industrial Design Standards, amend, amending related zoning and development regulations in the Kent City Code, and appealing Interim Zoning Ordinance 4320 related to trucking intensive land uses. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Council Member Boyce. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to say, um, I think about the day when we first started this year, the advisory committee, and we was far apart. And um, I just want to say that really, um, at the end of the day for me, it's really about getting people together and being able to talk. Um, we as a city, we have our subject matter expert on how we think we want the city to be. And we have the business community too that plays a part in that. And I think by Mr. Seagali and Mike and, and, and Kirsten getting together with us to sit down and to figure out what's best for the city, to make it a win-win situation. And a um, lot of talk, a lot of conversation, but at the end of the day, I think we're in a really good spot. And I feel really good about where we're at. And uh, I'll just say once again, Mark and team, uh, thank you for not giving up. Thank you for working with us. I mean, I think um, this is a good example going forward, you know, with the business and the city working together. We can do a lot of good things together. Uh, we have a lot of things in common on what we want to see for the city. And I think uh, this has just been a, uh, a good example of the business community and the, and the city working together. And I look forward to us continuing this year. So also for Kurt and his team, I felt for a little while working for Kurt, right? <laughs> a lot of hours, you know, just talking this through. And a phenomenal team, Kurt, you have just an awesome team and uh, just a willing to listen. And uh, we don't have all the answer. And I just uh, want to say kudos to you and your team. And uh, this is really going to take us to the next level. So thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Fincher. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to echo those same kudos to Council Member Boyce, who was basically the touchstone here for the council, to Kurt and his team, to the Sigales, to the Port of Seattle, to all of the business businesses in the business community that stepped forward to spend all of the hours that you did pulling this plan together, that that's an example of what it what does come out, an outcome that is workable for both sides. Neither side got 100% of what they wanted, but we have something very workable that we're going to move forward with. So uh, thank you for the time that you took in meeting with all of us, all of the, there were a lot of hours involved in this project. So just thank you to all of you guys who helped put this together. Thank you. Council Member Core. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
I want to echo what Councilmember Fincher and Councilmember Boyce have said. So thank you, Kurt and team. Thank you, Haley, for taking the time to work on this project. It's important. We need to uh, set our vision where we're going. If we don't define that now, we will be going blind and we'll be ending up where we don't want to be. So thank you for helping um, with this vision. And I want to thank all the business, all the advisory members uh, who worked on this with us. And we are looking forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Okay, hey, any additional discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Hello, I Beth. feel like there's a, I was just yeah. gonna say, I feel like it's a round of applause time. Um, so you heard the council members acknowledge that the amount of work that has gone into this project over the past year, Kurt and Bill and Haley and Danielle, wherever you are, um, <laughs> It's been incredible. Our, our community partners, our business partners, the willingness to, to come to those meetings and provide that input, um, everyone that, that completed the surveys, all of those things, to, to put this process through. We made a commitment a year ago to do this as quickly as possible. Um, I think that we, we lived up to that. We made it before that interim zoning um, ordinance expired. It's a ton of work. Our legal department, you guys have been amazing, Adam and Tammy and Adam and Adam and Adam. Um, it, it's just been a ton of work um, wanting to make sure that we do this correctly because it is important to the city, but it's also important to the business community. And Mr. Pruitt, as you pointed out, we are a warehousing and logistics community. That is what we were built on. That's not going away. We just needed to figure out a better way to do that. And I feel like this product is our future and the better way to do that. So thank you to everyone for their patience, their willingness to participate. It's what makes a good product. Um, and now we are gonna move forward and start figuring out what implementation looks like. So, and thank you council for all of your work and support and willingness to learn. Um, I think all of us have learned things about, you know, tilt up buildings and, <laughs> and all of those kinds of things. So um, just a big thank you to everyone involved in this project. It's this is really important, so thank you. All right, um, we will move on to public comment. So this is an opportunity for members of the audience to address the council with issues, concerns, um, things they'd like to see the council take up in the future. We do ask that you limit your comments to three minutes and um, state your name and city of residence for the record. Kim, can you please call our speakers? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have two people signed up to speak, Dan Stryford and Julia Morris. Hi, I'm back again. Um, I still haven't heard about Danielle, whether we're gonna get some help with that. Yep. So I have a report for you. So as you may have gathered from my comment, um, Danielle, wherever you are, she has left the city for a new opportunity, I believe, with the Port of Seattle. But before she left, I did get a chance to do some work with her. She's laid out for me some, um, some of her recommendations, including... Um, some things for us to work on, like a climate element in our 2023 comprehensive plan update. She gave me some um, Senate bills that are working their way through the Senate to keep track of. And I will be attending the um, April 24th meeting um, of electeds, the work group for K4C, to get bring back the information on the new standards and looking at what the other cities in the region are adopting. Okay. Um, and, and also, um, she let me know about some work that our environmental group, um, Tony Donati and Mira are working on on their on their side, and I know that you've done some work with them. So yeah. I got all the updates. We'll be moving forward, and we're going to be just plugging away at this process. I, I would just like to say I wasn't aware of this um, rally the valley thing that was going on. My ignorance as a citizen of, of Kent, but um, in my mind, you're doing ex exactly what we need to be doing to push this K4C thing. It's all about good economics. It's all about sustainability. Um, and so I think you're right on track. And I think the, the main thing we need to do is document this so that we can coordinate with the county on their plans. Um, and maybe there's a few more things that we could do to become more energy efficient or uh, use of solar power on all these warehouses in the valley, um, use it to, to power the electric vehicles. Um, 
it's, it's, it makes good economic sense. So Agreed. I will bring back um, the meeting. The, the elected work group is the 24th of April, and I will bring back a report um, following that meeting, and I'm hoping to learn about some of the additional best practices. I know that... Um, Issaquah, Mercer Island are doing some some innovative things in that on that front. And then as soon as we get somebody on board to replace Danielle, we'll also add yeah. that. To I, I know place. several of the PCA cities have hired a full time sustainable sustainability person. I think you've kind of got we, we, that's happening here. Right. So we've, got, we've got pieces. It's just of a that, matter of kind know. of getting it all lined up with the goals of the county. Yeah, exactly. OK, appreciate everything you're doing. Like, thank, thank you. you. Okay, our next speaker. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Julia. My name is Julia Morse. I live in the CDA of Seattle, and I work here in Canada Refugee Resettlement Agency. Um, I'm here tonight on behalf of uh, the local planning area group to share a little bit about our work here. Um, extend a warm invitation to any of you to attend the LPA meetings, um, or an invitation to any other representatives of organizations or companies that are supporting camp residents who are low income or are facing other barriers. Um, so the local planning area is a monthly meeting held at the Kent DSHS Community Service Office. It's attended by DSHS staff, representatives of community colleges, refugee and immigrant service centers, other nonprofits, and for-profit companies um, who are civically minded, engaged, and, and interested in supporting low income and people facing barriers in, in Kent. And we use this space to share information about our organizations, um, share resources with each other, and troubleshoot issues that we're facing. Um, we occasionally host meetings at different locations so the host organizations can tour us around and, and we can all learn about what resources are available in our communities. Um, we also host our own LPA events as a group. Our work plan this two-year period includes hosting a resource fair and connecting LPA organizations to mental health first aid training so all of us can be more prepared to address the growing mental health concerns in our communities. Um, this space has been really useful for me since I started attending last summer. It's an opportunity to make connections with other organizations and get a big picture perspective on what issues and gaps in services in the area are and how we can do things like apply for new grants to um, fill those gaps and build the coalitions that we need. Um, our meetings are hosted the third Tuesday of every month, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at the Kent DSHS Community Service Office. We would love to see any of you there and to the public, um, anybody who works for an organization that um, has a stake in this in this. Um, fight to, <laughs> to build stronger, healthier, and happier communities. Um, thank you all for your time. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate your time. OK, Kim, do we have any other speakers? I have nobody else signed up to speak. All right, then that ends our public comment. We will move on in the agenda to the consent calendar. The consent calendar is a compilation of items that the council has addressed at their committee of the whole meetings, which happen on the off weeks of our first and third Tuesday council meetings. Uh, Council President Troutner, do you have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move to approve consent calendar items A through F. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much. Um, item number nine has been removed because we had a historic passing of Rally the Valley's um, new, new guidelines, new structure. Um, Again, thank you to the council for all your work on that, as well as all the city staff and community members that have been involved in that. Item number 10 is um, bids. We do not have any this evening. So that brings us down to item 11, which is executive session. The council will enter into executive session for approximately five minutes to discuss property negotiations. There will be action following uh, executive session. So at this point, I would like to ask everyone to clear the council chambers. We will move into executive session and be back with a motion after that.
welcome back. The council is reconvening after an executive session regarding property negotiations. Um, a motion would be in order regarding purchase of property. Uh, council, is there a motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I move to authorize the mayor to sign a purchase and sale agreement and all other documents necessary to acquire the Ostrovsky property in support of the Signature Point Levy Improvement Project, subject to final terms and conditions acceptable to the Public Works Director and the City Attorney. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion regarding this motion? All right. Seeing none, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Um, and with that, we have come to the end of our agenda. Just want to remind everyone again, State of the City Address on Thursday. We'd love to see you there. And if not, go ahead and watch it on Facebook Live. And with that, we are adjourned.